All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are going to get started in just a couple of minutes, but I want to give folks time to join if they haven't done so already. So thank you for your patience and we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Again, thank you everyone so much for joining this afternoon. We really appreciate it. I'm gonna give folks just a couple more of minutes to join if they haven't done so already, and then we will go ahead and get started. So thank you for your patience and we will get started momentarily. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Welcome everyone uh, to the fifth weekly media briefing in the lead up to the 2020 election. My name is Becky Timmons. I am the communications coordinator here at Common Cause and today's topic is election protection. Um, so election protection is a nonpartisan coalition of hundreds of voting rights, civil rights and public interest groups, including Common Cause that is dedicated to protecting the vote and helping voters troubleshoot issues they have when voting. Um, we believe that nothing should get between an eligible voter and the ballot box. And as leaders of the EP coalition, we work with election officials to respond when voters are confused, turned away or intimidated at the polls. Today, we will hear from our national grassroots organizer, Izzy Bronstein, about poll monitor recruitment and rapid response so far this election. And then we will hear from our state leaders in Ohio, Georgia, and Pennsylvania about the ground game in their states. Um, you have permission to record this. We will also record this and send it out after this call. So to kick us off, I'm going to shoot it over to my awesome colleague, Izzy Bronstein, to uh, do a sort of national overview of what election protection uh, is and what we're doing. Izzy. Awesome, thanks Becky. Um, I'm Izzy Bronstein, I'm the National Grassroots Organizer at Common Cause, as Becky said. Election protection this year is an incredible program. We have, in the past, we've seen around 6,000 volunteers in 2018. This year, we've got about five times as many volunteers already registered to join us for election protection. So about 30,000 folks have already registered to support our election protection efforts and to make sure that they're protecting the vote. And as Becky said, making sure that nobody gets between the voter um, and the ballot. That means that the folks are monitoring social media to look for mis and disinformation. We've got thousands of volunteers who are scouring the internet to find the mis and disinformation, voters having problems, and making sure we elevate those situations, respond, and intervene to help voters. We've got folks who are outside of polling places as poll monitors, helping voters who have questions around what does a provisional ballot mean? Am I at the right polling place? They said, they're telling me I'm not registered to vote. We've got volunteers who are trained and ready to help voters with all those problems. We also have rovers, who are folks who are going around to different polling places, checking on things like signage or curbside voting to make sure that the polling place is equipped and ready for all the voters who are coming in. We're also checking on lines to make sure that lines are indicative of the problems that might be happening inside um, the polling location itself and reporting all those things back to central command so we can deal with situations that may arise. Finally, we've got an amazing voter contact program, which is doing rapid response to text and call voters who may be having troubles or be, um, you know, having situations that arise in polling places or in jurisdictions where situations are constantly changing. Our team is, is all ready to make sure that no matter what is happening in a situation, that every voter gets to cast their ballot. Our volunteers are being trained and equipped by incredible state organizations, some of whom you'll hear from today, who are leading the efforts in every state to make sure that no matter what the situation is, no matter where the voter is telling us that they've got a problem, no matter where they're hearing about their problems, 
that we are there to make sure that every voter um, casts their ballot. Um, the other thing I'll just say is that, the, as Becky said, this is an incredible coalition of organizations that have come together to build this movement. We've got folks from all walks of life who are coming together because they realize that protecting our vote, no matter whose vote they're casting it for, is the most important thing that we can do together this election to make sure that every voter is actually being heard and make sure that they feel that they can trust, every voter can trust the system and make sure that they know that their vote is counted and processed accurately. I think with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, I think that's most of what I have to say. Awesome, thanks, Izzy. Um, I'm now gonna pass it to Catherine Churser, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause Ohio. Hi, everybody. Uh, hello from Ohio. Uh, so we've approached this year a little bit differently simply because of the pandemic. And so when we think about election protection, a lot of times we have this picture of the, the poll monitors right there outside the polls, watching to see what's going on, calling into the hotline. And so this year it's slightly, we, you know, things are a little bit different. And, and so this is how we have approached it. So election protection is a coalition. Um, and so we have wonderful coalition and partners, including the League of Women Voters and uh, ACLU and NAACP and Ohio Council of Churches. And together we created these, um, what I think of as um, Board of Election Prep Teams. And so in counties all over Ohio, they were gathering information about the election administration plans and developing relationships with election administrators so that we would know how best to, to work together and to help. Then we also have this process, we would call them election ambassadors. And the election ambassadors are responsible for getting yard signs out. We have 10,000 yard signs all over Ohio. Um, and then also the election ambassadors also hand out information. Um, now it's not the traditional canvassing that you often think about, but it would be walking in the neighborhoods, dropping off the postcards that have election protection information on them so that people who have a little bit worry about, you know, about, you know, the safety and seeing others and masks and all that kind of stuff, so they can participate and really let people know about the hotline. Then we have people that are early vote. Um, and then we have rovers that are just driving by early vote and saying, oh, that line is long. Um, and we'll be doing the same kind of things on election day. The other thing that's a little different in Ohio this year is that we are doing poll monitoring programs all over the state, including, um, so this year um, I, I took a trip with yard signs all the way down to Portsmouth, Ohio from Columbus. Um, and we're going to have a project that really focuses on more rural areas and goes from Portsmouth all the way up to East Liverpool. And if you're not an Ohioan, these are not the names of towns that you're familiar with. But I think it's really um, exciting this year that people all over the state are feeling the need to make sure that everybody's voice is heard and that we're able to go and cast a ballot. And then I wanted to highlight um, this one little thing that happened at the very beginning of early vote. So we have this texting program and I'm sure you've been hearing about different texting programs that campaigns are doing. Well, we um, set aside a little bit of money because we something would pop up. What I did not expect is the very first day that we had early votes to discover that in fact, Franklin County um, Board of Elections had unfortunately sent what turns out to be about 50,000 voters the wrong ballot. And so we quickly, because we, didn't, we did not know exactly how many, but we had information from the Franklin County Board of Elections about how voters could tell if they had the correct ballot um, we sent out 100,000 texts to folks who had requested to vote by mail so that they knew that they needed to check their ballot because we had been sharing all this information about, hey, you need to get that in as soon as possible. And I think that was something that makes the, the election protection program this year much more robust. And so we're addressing, as Izzy talked about, the social media monitoring, but also using other tools um, during a pandemic like texting. And on that note, I'll hand it to the next person. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm now going to pass it over to Anna Dennis, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause Georgia. Anna. 
Good afternoon, y'all, and thank you all for highlighting Georgia and having us speak today. So I'm going to go ahead and hop in. I know last week we discussed some issues in Georgia, but we saw that those issues still are happening in Georgia as of this week. Um, Monday, we had our first day of early voting. We saw over 128,000 folks actually went out to the polls on the first day of early voting to actually exercise their vote. However, on Monday, we still saw issues that have been systemic to Georgia. We saw issues of line hours waits of six to eight to nine hours of people waiting in line. We saw issues of precincts not opening on time. We saw issues of folks not having, um, using emergency ballots when the line wait was over 30 minutes. We saw things of machines not working and our poll workers not knowing how to use our new technologies. So these are things that are still pervasive in Georgia that we are focused on. However, the one thing we did see on Monday and that we saw on Tuesday and even today is how resilient the folks in Georgia are and how there's such a willingness to still wait in line, hold the line, and still be adamant on making sure their voices can count. Um, in Georgia, we also saw that there has been things like voter intimidation that are happening at the polls. In America's Georgia, we saw that there were um, folks who are part of the Trump army waving flags and having guns on their hips. And we know in Georgia, it's an open carry state. And so that was very concerning. And we've had conversations with local law enforcement. We've had conversations with the Secretary of State's office and the governor's office to make sure that we can remedy these issues and make sure that our elections are still safe and secure for every voter who wants to have access um, to the ballot. Recently, we actually just got a uh, verdict from uh, or a ruling from Judge Totenberg about having emergency paper ballots in Georgia. How I'll explain this to people is most people don't know what the makeup of a Georgia voter looks like. So we are living in a time of a pandemic. This is a math issue. So we're in a pandemic. Folks are homeschooling their kids. We are a working class state where people will clock in and clock out at seven o'clock in the morning. They may get to leave at 430 or eight o'clock in the morning and leaving at 5 p.m. So that only leaves a certain amount of hours where people are actually able to vote in Georgia or they have access to the ballot. Yes, we have early voting. However, early voting hours are set by our county election officials. So that means that some places they're starting their early voting at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. and they're closing at 4.30, 4 o'clock, 5 p.m. So that means that leaves a, a lot of people from not having access to the ballot, which is an issue. So with that makeup of a voter, what happens is, is in our peak times, before work hours and after work hours, you see people waiting in line. No one really has time to wait in line for two to three to eight to nine hours to cast their ballot. So when we've asked judges to give more remedies on paper ballots, it's because we know that there's an uptick of voters who are going to the polls, people who are, are new to what our democracy is with voting in Georgia. We know that there's a lot of vigor and a lot of attention on this election. And there's a lot of enthusiasm and energy from Georgia voters who actually want their ballots to count. So these are definitely issues in Georgia and I'm happy to talk about them a little bit later. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Anna. And finally, we have Suzanne Almeida, who is the Interim Executive Director of Common Cause Pennsylvania. Thanks, Becky, and it's so great to be back here again today. We have um, an amazing election protection program in Pennsylvania, and we're so excited uh, to talk a little bit about it. So we are at Common Cause Pennsylvania leading a growing coalition of at least 20 organizations. I say at least because every day I have a conversation with some organization that wants to join us in our effort to make sure that every single voter has a good and positive experience on election day and that every single voter voters vote counts. Um, we have over 2,400 volunteers that have signed up uh, to volunteer with Common Cause Pennsylvania. Those will be folks who will be doing a variety of things, right? So we will have folks on the ground trained as poll monitors on election day to assist voters with any individual questions and be our eyes and ears on the ground if something is going wrong. Um, we'll also have ro roving teams similar to what Catherine uh, described to make sure that we can cover as much area as possible and also to give extra support to any polling locations 
that may be seeing problems. And then of course, we are plugged in uh, to the social media monitoring dis and misinformation program at Common Cause National, as well as running um, a great text uh, contact program with voters from uh, particularly counties where they're not getting a lot of contact, right? So we know in Pennsylvania, there are some counties where uh, everyone and their mother wants to come in and talk to voters, which is fantastic, but there's voters across the state too. So we're making sure that voters who live outside of say Philadelphia or outside of Pittsburgh are, are also getting some contact. Um, we are looking to deploy in the field at least a thousand volunteers on election day to do that uh, eyes and ears on the ground. Um, and make sure that again every voter has the information that they need to cast their ballot safely and securely and have a positive experience in addition to common cause i want to be really clear we are not the only organization that working to recruit and deploy volunteers in a coordinated program in pennsylvania right we have several partners who are looking to also recruit and deploy volunteers across the state and these are organizations that are particularly important to have in this program because they are organizations that have deep Deep connections to the communities with which they are working, right? So we want folks from those communities working in those communities uh, on election day. Um, I'm going to do a really quick update on a couple other things that are happening in Pennsylvania because, as you know, it's never quiet here and y'all didn't hear from me last week. Um, so really quickly, uh, two things. So one quick litigation update. We had a huge win for democracy last Saturday at about noon. Judge Ranjan in the Western District of Pennsylvania dismissed all of the Trump campaign's um, claims in Trump v. Book Bar, which is the federal case that challenged things like drop boxes, um, made it more difficult, would have made it more difficult for voters to vote uh, in any number of ways, tried to bring in out of county poll watchers, and generally was anti-voter legislation litigation wrapped up in kind of voting rights language. So we are thrilled with that. We are expecting an appeal, um, but we will take the win as we get it. And I think it was really um, worth looking at that decision because Judge Ranjan had asked the Trump campaign, provide us with evidence of likely voter fraud, and they were unable to do that. And the judge was really clear in his opinion that without that evidence, you can't put additional restrictions on the right to vote. Um, we also saw just moments ago, I think it came across my desk at like 11 a.m., uh, that the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania granted Secretary Bookvar's King's Bench petition to decide the question of signature match, whether signature match can be used to disqualify voted vote by mail ballots. Um, that will be on an expedited briefing schedule, so we're anticipating a decision in that next week. And then also last week, we saw a decision in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia from Judge Glazer uh, about the issue of whether poll watchers, so those are folks in Pennsylvania that stand inside the polls, they're credentialed, they have to be affiliated with a candidate or party, are uh, able to uh, do their poll watching in what we call satellite elections offices. So essentially county elections offices that are other places um, and are one-stop shops for folks to uh, register to vote, request an absentee or mail-in ballot, receive that ballot, vote it, and turn it in all in a one-stop shop. Um, so the Trump campaign had sued to see if they could uh, insist that poll watchers were allowed in these county elections offices. Judge Glazer said no, which is, again, a win for democracy and more um, confirmation that the folks who are in charge of running Pennsylvania's elections really care deeply about making sure that every vote counts. So it's not just the advocates, it's also the folks in charge. I also have a quick list of voting updates. So satellite elections offices, which I just talked about, op have opened in several counties already. They have been a fantastic success. We are seeing thousands of voters who are voting safely, securely, and early on an in-person um, mail-in ballot. I know that that sounds a little confusing and I'm happy to answer more questions later. Um, we have 2.6 million people as of earlier this week. It's uh, certainly higher by now who have applied to vote by mail in Pennsylvania, which is particularly notable just as a reminder because this is the first year that any eligible Pennsylvania voter can apply to vote by mail, right? So it's new and it's exciting and it's great. Um, and then finally, I have a little bit of bad news. Uh, this morning we found out that Allegheny County sent out incorrect ballots to slightly over 28,000 voters. 
Um, obviously, this is not ideal. Um, this is, you know, the kind of mistake that happens in elections, however, and Allegheny County is taking steps to fix that, right? So the mailings have been corrected, ballots that were slated to go out that were incorrect have been cor um, corralled and destroyed. Um, they are, they know which individuals received an incorrect ballot. It, um, they are folks who were mailed in a batch that was on um, September 28th. They will have a tracker available starting hopefully tomorrow. Um, so folks can check to see whether they are one of the affected voters. If they are an affected voter, they will be receiving a new ballot, um, a new ballot package, right? Start soup to nuts, the whole thing, not just the ballot, the outer envelope, the secrecy envelope, the instructions and the ballot. Um, it will have a marking on the outer envelope. Um, a, I've heard either a yellow sticker or an orange stripe, something to make sure that uh, they know that these are replacement ballots. Um, and then uh, those ballots should be leaving the post, getting to the post office end of this week, ending up in voters mailboxes the week of October 19th. Here's a flag that I do really wanna make sure that voters are aware of. If you are on this list, one, your vote will not be counted twice, right? They are tracking this very carefully. Any voter, any ballots that have been returned from this incorrect batch have been hand sorted and segregated. So there is no way that an individual voter is going to vote twice. You should check on the tracker when it's available to see whether or not you are an affected voter. If you are, please wait patiently for your ballot to come. Um, the County Board of Elections asks that no, or has, said that no replacement ballots, so second dairy replacement ballots, not the first batch is going out to all of the affected voters, um, will be issued for these voters until October 26th. So it's going to require a little bit of patience, it's going to require a little bit of trust, but um, there are folks working very hard to make sure that every voter is educated, every affected voter and voters in general are educated about the system and uh, hopefully we will be able to get this straightened out. And with that, I will turn it back over to Becky. Thank you, Suzanne. I am now going to open it up for questions. So there are a couple of ways in which you can do that. You can put your question in the Q&A box that you see on the bottom of your screen. Or if you would like to ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand and I will um, allow you to talk. Um, I just ask that you uh, identify yourself and the news outlet you are with. So I already see one. Um, Jim, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, hi, this is Jim Otte from WHIO TV over the press room at the State House in Columbus, Ohio. This is a question for Catherine and then anybody else who, uh, who might want to chime in. But Catherine, I'm especially interested to hear your response. Four years ago, there was much misinformation, especially on Facebook and elsewhere on social media. Uh, the specific example I'm talking about is that fake photo of supposedly uh, pre-written uh, out ballots for Hillary Clinton. This went all over the world. Uh, it turned out to be completely fake. Um, Catherine, talk about your efforts to try and get at some of this disinformation that's uh, out on the internet. Uh, first off, your intent, and then secondly, how do you do that? So I will answer this to the best of my ability, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna hand it off to Izzy to give a little bit more information um, I think, you know, we live in this amazing time period where we have access to so much different information and stories from all sorts of different people and the ability to kind of better understand circumstances. Unfortunately, all of this access to more information leads to a lot of bad information. And some of it is just confusion and, and it's not intended to be disinformation. But of course, we need to be pushing back so that voters get really good information. Now, one of the ways that um, the folks that are, that are part of the election protection team in Ohio have been doing that has to do with making sure that when we see something that we report it to the election protection hotline so that there's immediate pushback. Um, and then, then Common Cause nationally has this really wonderful program that has coordinated, I think there are around 50 Ohio volunteers that go on and sign up and they just spend their time looking for misinformation 
Um, they, they work with the national folks to provide good information and to work also um, with the Board of Election officials and the Secretary of State so that the best we can do is to squash this. Um, but of course, we're so siloed um, that you need folks from all over the country looking at social media in multiple places to get at this information. Izzy, did you want to kind of give a little more sense of how that whole process works? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. So as Catherine said, social media is an incredible place where we get to share information with our communities and we get to learn about what people are, are talking about and thinking about. It does mean that there's a lot of misinformation. It also means that voters are posting when they have problems. So when voters got the wrong ballots in Ohio or got ballots or you know, missed ballots in Ohio, we knew about that in part because of social media. So there people were talking about it on social channels. So we got to respond to those voters and make sure that they knew the correct information. Our social media monitoring process is a pretty simple one. Basically, we use social listening tools as well as, as Catherine was saying, folks own social media channels, which are so critical because conversations are happening in the, the Columbus moms who like to hike groups. They're happening in the bread bakers of America groups. They're not happening in the we care about democracy groups. But voters are asking questions of people who they relate to, who they care about, and who they trust to give them the right information. So we want to make sure that our folks who are in those channels are providing the right information back. If we're seeing wrong information on channels, if it's misinformation, sometimes it's as simple as making sure that that's taken, that you know, we tell the voter or we tell the person who's posting it and they take it right down. If it's disinformation, we have a reporting process that gets escalated and depending on what the content is, we can actually work with the channel to get that content removed if it's causing harm to voters. Um, and that whole process, it just depends on what the sort of content and problem is uh, to make sure that every voter who is seeing content that is happening on social media knows how to respond to it and deal with it. Um, if there's anything else, my colleague Jesse's on the line who might have something else to add, but that's mostly what I want to say. Um, <clears throat> hi, this is Jesse Littlewood, the Vice President for Campaigns at Common Cause, and um, I'll just very briefly um, highlight that um, when it comes to the challenges that voters are seeing, um, we uh, the question um, highlighted one particular kind of disinformation, which is the uh, the time, place, or manner uh, of elections is one type of disinformation we often see, where people are falsely claiming how someone can vote in a way that's not accurate. The second and more sort of specific to the question that was asked was a, a conspiracy theory or false narrative or manipulated media that tries to promote a, a, a theory or a false narrative that there is a malfeasance or um, some kind of uh, a bad actor you know, actually involved in the election process themselves. Um, there are other disinformation threats that appear um, across social media and other forms of media. Um, uh, first, you know, our, our recommendation to voters is to be careful and skeptical about what they uh, consume and to check the source of that information, um, as well as uh, our reporting uh, intake line for disinformation tips is at commoncause.org slash disinfo. And so any uh, voter can uh, or, or concerned citizen or um, member of the public that sees something that concerns them can submit their disinformation tip on that. And as Izzy mentioned, we are often able to remove much of the most um, pernicious and dangerous content on this from the social media platforms themselves. However, much of it maintains because it's either opinion or it's a conspiracy theory dressed up as reportage or news. So to that end, we through the work of our volunteers and our communications experts have crafted what we think is useful pro-voter information that pre-bunks or sort of, you know, before the disinformation gets to people, helps voters not be affected by disinformation should they see it. And we distribute that through our organizations as well as through our volunteers as a way of helping voters before disinformation lands on their newsfeed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Bob, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Hi, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, go ahead, Bob. Great. Um, a, a couple of things on um, court related matters. Since the Trump campaign has indicated uh, that they are appealing to the uh, Third Circuit, uh, do you have any insight as to what the timeline uh, could be for that playing out? Uh, have you been notified of any formal appeal being filed by them? Do you have uh, filings that you're doing or do you have to await their action before you can uh, uh, do so? Just sketch out a bit if you know uh, where things stand and how uh, quickly that's likely to happen in the little time left. Sure, so the easy answer is quickly. How quickly and exactly what the schedule will be, we don't know yet, right? All we have um, is the public indication that they're going to appeal, uh, not so much the actual filings. Um, you know, I, it's really hard to read the tea leaves about how quickly anything will move through the courts, but I do think it's important to note that the Third Circuit and also the Supreme Court of the United States, where I actually think this will ultimately end up, both know about the timeline, right? Like it's not a secret that the election is coming up. And so um, there is an incentive across the board for uh, courts to rule quickly. Um, there's always a balance though, right? Because on the one hand, you need time for briefing, you need time to make argument. Um, we don't want courts deciding without all of the information in front of them, but we certainly do want decisions um, as quickly as possible because we know that the election is right around the corner and voters and county elections officials both need certainty in our elections. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to check, uh, you had mentioned uh, about the uh, situation in Allegheny County, the ballots that were sent, uh, the incorrect ballots that were sent to some voters. Uh, your Ohio uh, representative there indicated there was a similar uh, situation in Ohio. By any chance, would either of you know if the same vendor was involved? Allegheny County indicated there was a vendor, I believe the name was Midwest Direct, uh, uh, I guess that would be a question for either or both of you, if you know if by any chance the same vendor was involved in that sort of error. So this is Catherine. Um, unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. I do know that the, 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 it was the same, the, the, the vendor that was the issue in Summit County was the same vendor, which is Akron, is the same vendor as, um, you know, up in Lucas County where Toledo is. Um, we can certainly get back to you just, you know, to confirm that. Thank you. Uh, Gabriella, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Thanks. So my question is for Anna. Uh, you mentioned that there were some Trump supporters carrying guns outside of polling places. Um, and I'm not sure if you're aware, there were reports last week about former special forces being sought by private security companies to guard polls in Minnesota. So how concerned are you about something similar happening in Georgia, being that it is an open carry state? And what is your strategy for ensuring that voters feel safe enough to wait in line to vote if they have to wait? So thank you for your question, Gabriella. In Georgia, we are definitely concerned um, about this issue. We're definitely concerned because like I mentioned that Georgia is an open carry state. So we are concerned that we will have folks who are civilian vigilantes who want to um, dissuade and discourage voters um, from voting. Um, we're concerned that because we're open carry state that they will say that they're actually trying to stand their ground to disrupt elections. So we're definitely concerned um, about that. And we have heard of stories um, from our partners in other states. And also we've heard of best practices of what can be done in our election protection coalition around this issue. So like I mentioned earlier, we are um, working with uh, the highest level of uh, government in Georgia. We are working with our coalition partners in election protection. We are working with our everyday folks um, who are uh, pumped up and enthusiastic about elections to make sure that we can keep our folks encouraged and feeling resilient um, to uh, actually stand in line and come to the polls and making sure that we're not afraid to vote. Because what people don't realize is that, as I've mentioned before um, on these calls, um, that 
Georgia is um, a place that has a history of suppressing the ballot and there have been a history of problems. Um, as a black woman, I can tell you that our state has systemic um, issues and disparate impacts when it comes to racial minorities and how we enter uh, the ballot box. And so hearing that, you know, on Monday that there were folks who are openly showing their guns and waving um, their Trump signs uh, at a polling location or, you know, in the electioneering um, zone, that's troubling and problematic because as a person, I want to be able to stand in line without fear of what's going to happen to me if I'm casting um, my ballot. So we're definitely working with folks to make sure that our public in Georgia is still encouraged to come out to vote. But I can also say that that's nothing new for folks in Georgia. We're used to this type of behavior. And I can tell you that because what we saw on Monday that people still waited for two to three to six to eight to nine hours in line, that we are still encouraged and not dissuade from actually casting our ballot. So they can come, tote their guns, wave their Trump signs, whatever they want to do, but we will not be moved. We are still going to cast our ballot. Hi, and um, my name is Sylvia Albert. I'm the Director of Voting and Elections, and I kind of wanted just to jump in and give a um, a national kind of perspective. And thank you, Anna, for talking specifically about Georgia. Um, you know, intimidation at the polls is extremely rare and illegal in every state. There are federal laws, and in addition, there are state laws. Um, this type of uh, behavior has been um, threatened before, and we have only seen isolated incidents. Um, and we want to be really careful, kind of not to, while we want voters to, um, you know, be safe, uh, we want to be really careful about. Um, about lifting up these threats, because the threat in and of itself is actually fulfilling the want of the threatener, which is voter suppression, right? So our message to voters is there's an entire um, election protection coalition of hundreds of groups around the country who are going to be watching polling locations and having rapid and have rapid response plans for how to respond to protect the voter. Um, and so to please call us if they see anything at 866-OUR-VOTE, but that we want voters to know that we are there watching and their job is to make a plan to vote and to vote. Thank you. And um, we do have some guidance, sorry, I'll put it in the chat. There is some guidance that's, um, that um, I'm not sure what press group put uh, created about how to talk about um, violence at the polls in a, or uh, how to talk about intimidation in a way that doesn't actually intimidate voters. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Thank you. And then finally, I'm going to throw this out to all of you, but if you could speak to what are some of the typical scenarios or what kind of scenarios poll monitors in your state are preparing for? And then Izzy, if you could sort of speak to what are the election protection volunteers preparing for on the national level? That would be really great. So whoever wants to take a stab first, I'll toss it to Anna first. So scenario wise, typically things that can happen on um, election day, we are in our early voting um, time frame. So this is definitely a test run to what we may see on election day. So when we have our volunteers who are mobilized, who are roving to different precincts, they're making sure that folks have the correct voter information, that they're at the right precinct, because we do sometimes have last minute changes. We're in a time frame of COVID, so changes are happening rapidly. So we wanna make sure the messages get out um, physically. So putting up new signs to say, hey, your precinct has moved here. We make sure that we work with our social media monitors to make sure that they're getting out the information of where these changes are um, happening as well. So that's something that we may see um, on election day and that we are seeing uh, right now of like locations telling each other, hey, this is where the long lines are happening. This precinct may have a five minute wait. There are some that may have a two hour wait. So we're basically trying to make sure that folks um, stay in the loop and that we can do rapid response um, to make sure that we can gear up for um, our election day. 
So this is Catherine. I was going to say um, the kind of typical things that we're encouraging people to look for have to do with how many provisional ballots you see. You know, people leave with provisional ballots. They they come out. And, you know, we encourage our poll monitors to ask, well, why is it you weren't able to cast a regular ballot? And this is a really good way of identifying whether the provisional ballot was given appropriately or whether um, there was an obstacle. You know, for example, because of COVID, um, people can go in with voter of identification, like a driver's license, that is not up to date um, because it basically has, it has to be as of March you know, March and the beginning of the pandemic. But there are things like that can, that can, little tiny things that can be obstacles to people casting a regular ballot. And then because we're in this COVID era, we have curbside voting. And what is not, what is a challenge is like, how are they doing the signage for curbside voting? And so one of the things we've been looking at at early vote is how difficult is it for folks to navigate hey, I want to drop off my absentee vote or my vote by mail. I'm going to drop it off at the drop box at the Board of Elections. How is it difficult, you know, how hard is it to figure out how to do curbside voting if you don't want to leave your car? Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that we will be looking at. Some are specific to like kind of the details of elections that can go wrong. And some are like the COVID-19, you know, the COVID-19, the pandemic kind of preparation things. We have a lot of the same issues. So in a typical year, we are looking at things like lines. We're looking at things like voter confusion. Um, we're anticipating this year because it's the first year that any eligible voter who wants to can vote by mail in Pennsylvania, that there's going to be a lot of questions from voters about um, what happens if they change their mind and want to vote in person. We're anticipating questions from voters. We're anticipating questions from poll workers. Um, we're also, you know, looking at the same sorts of things, like what are the uh, COVID protocols? What length uh, are the lines? How quickly are things moving? Are voters coming out feeling like they had a good experience? Um, you know, sometimes it's provisional ballots. Sometimes it's, you know, just kind of an atmosphere, making sure that voters are really having a positive experience, I think is, is the thing that we are going for. And we look at to do that, um, Oh, you know, on both the front end, right? So as the voter is going into the polls, like making sure that they have the information where we'll have know your rights palm cards that folks can have just to remind them um, that they have rights uh, as a voter and that they can, they should feel empowered to exercise those rights regardless of if someone's trying to push back on them, but also on the layout, right? To make sure that um, everything went the way it should and that they felt like they had a positive experience. So. Our uh, poll monitors are really our eyes and ears on the ground, both for big stuff and little stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that's really why we do this, right? It's a voter centric program to make sure that voters who are the core of this are having a good experience and able to cast ballots that get counted. There's another thing I want to add on to something that we're looking at in Georgia. Because we've had a lot of confusion with our different types of balloting options, which we're excited that we have multiple balloting options um, for this cycle and what more folks are exercising vote by mail. We're also still concerned about what happens when people go to the precincts that have requested a vote by mail ballot and they still haven't got their vote by vote by mail ballot because we're seeing that some folks is taking them 16 days to get their ballot after they've requested it. And so they're going to um, the precincts to actually try to vote in person. And then they're waiting in these lines to make sure that their ballot um, is canceled. So we're also looking to see what type of balloting options that they're using at the precinct. If they're using an emergency ballot, if they're using a provisional ballot, and as Catherine and Suzanne has mentioned, we're asking the questions kind of like, why is that happening? Um, and what's happened um, inside of the precinct and to make sure they have um, a fun and enjoyable voter um, experience, because like they mentioned before that we are in a COVID timeframe and a pandemic. So how we're all interacting with elections right now is actually different. And it's also different for our local elections offices. It's different for our poll workers who are actually administering the elections. Um, so we're definitely looking at how they're using emergency ballots, if they're using provisional ballots, um, or if people are able to actually uh, cast their ballots on our new machines um, in Georgia. 
And then I would just say, like, we're looking for the same things across in the country, like the folks that, the, that, that Suzanne and Anna and Catherine are mentioning. That's what we're training our volunteers in every state to look out for. And we're training our folks at the national level to keep their eyes on. Sometimes we have this experience where we're training volunteers in a state that has more expansive voting laws, and they can't believe what laws look like in other states. And they have a hard time imagining it. So we train them to understand that the whole system of voting is different state to state. And then we really wanna make sure we're uplifting the most accurate and correct information. And we're never telling a voter anything that's at all confusing or might cause more con um, concern when they're already coming to us and saying, I have a problem. We wanna make sure we're giving them the best information possible and we're training them to do that. We're training them to help every single voter, no matter who they're voting for. We're training them to make sure that they know that the system is a holistic machine. That if somebody finds something on social media, that we then tell our poll monitors to make sure that they go to that polling site if they're not already there to make sure that they're looking out for that situation. We're telling our texting team to make sure that they're texting the voters in that precinct or in that jurisdiction to let them know the solutions and that we're making sure the hotline is connected to the whole system. That's what we're really making sure our volunteers know is that they've got one key part of this puzzle and there's a whole system built up to make sure that we've got the puzzle worked out and that none of this is on any one person or one volunteer. We've got a whole system of response and system of collection to make sure every voter casts their ballot um, and that nobody gets between the voter and the ballot box. Awesome, thank you so much to you all. And thank you all for being here today. Um, with that, we're going to, oh, hang on, I see a potential question. Oh, sorry, one more question before we go. We almost had it. Um, for Suzanne, uh, has there been anything out of the ordinary that you've seen this election cycle that might prevent people from being able to easily vote in Pennsylvania compared to previous elections? So no other than the fact that we are in a pandemic, the fact that we are in um, an election that has incredibly heightened tensions, the fact like, you know, so there are things absolutely that could theoretically get in between a voter and the ballot box. That being said, they are all obstacles that I think every voter is facing, right? So it is anxiety about, do I vote by mail? Do I vote in person? What happens if I change my mind? Um, how do I know that my vote will be counted regardless of how I vote? Um, it's concerns about COVID, right? Concerns about making sure that if I make a plan to vote on October 14th, that plan still works on November 3rd. Um, and then I think there's just, you know, it is a hard time for everyone. There is a lot of anxiety, I guess, out in the world. And I think a lot of that is focused um, on voters, right? Because it feels like the weight of the world is on casting your ballot, regardless of who you're voting for. And so, you know, I would encourage voters to take the time, take a breath, make their plan. And I think that's absolutely the way to get there. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, this time for real. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, the main takeaway that we really want to reiterate today is that nothing should stand between an eligible voter and the right to vote. Um, and as leaders of the Election Protection Coalition, we really want to emphasize that we're working with election officials to respond to these challenges. And if any voters have issues uh, casting their ballot, they should look for our election protection poll monitors or the election protection hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. And if people wanna volunteer, they can sign up at protectthevote.net. Um, and thank you all so much again for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. And with that, um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.